الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I would like to welcome all of you to this new Muslim retreat, this virtual new Muslim retreat, which is brought to you by Islamic Information Center, Jam'iyya Dar al-Bir, and it's given the title Transform. And it's all about new Muslims dealing with and coping with this transformation that they're going to go through and that they are going through. And I would like to begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praising Almighty Allah who deserves to be praised. And I would like to start by asking Allah to exalt the mention and to grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to his family and to his companions. My name is Muhammad Tim Humble. I myself am a new Muslim, if that's the right word to use, perhaps the right word to use is an old new Muslim because it's been quite a while since I became Muslim. I became Muslim when I was 14 years old and that is over 20 years ago right now. So a long, long time to be honest. But I do remember what it was like and I do remember that feeling of transformation. And part of my job now that I do uh, part of my voluntary work and, and part of the job that I do generally is to be able to try to support people and help people who are going through that kind of transformation and try to, you know, maybe I would ho like to hope and I would ask Allah Azza wa Jalla, I would ask Allah mighty and majestic that he would make it easy that some of this would, would make it such that, the, that another person who goes down that road and who becomes Muslim would find things easier and, and would be able to manage the situation better uh, by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal than I did. So that's one of my goals in, uh, in delivering this kind of talk. When I started off, I started off thinking about transformation. What kind of transformation is a person really going through when they accept Islam? And there's an ayah, a passage of the Quran which just struck me as being such a, an amazing description of the transformation that a person goes through when they accept Islam. This ayah is in Surah Al-An'am, which is the sixth surah of the Quran, and the ayah number is 122. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ كَمَنْ مَثَلُهُ كَمَنْ مَثَلُهُ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ لَيْسَ بِخَارِجٍ مِنْهَا كَذَلِكَ زُيِّنَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ What about the person who was dead? And we brought him to life. And we gave him a light by which or with which he can walk among the people. Is that person the same as the one who is in the darkness? and is never going to come out from it. In this way, we have made appealing to the disbelievers what it was that they were doing. I just think that the contrast is, is exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it. Someone who was dead and became alive. It is a complete and total change a complete change in every aspect, like the change from death to life or from life to death. It is that much of a change. Is the one who was dead and then we gave him life. And we made for him a light with which to walk among the people like the one who is in the darkness and is never going to come out. 
Look at the example. Allah Azza give two examples here. The first is the example of the transition from death to life. Because that heart before Islam was dead. And that body before Islam was dead. And then when Islam came to that person and came into that person's heart, their heart was given life after its death. And that body was brought back to life after its death. And that soul was given a real life. A life that means something and matters to some. After it had been dead. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah mighty and majestic, He gave another example. The one who has been given a light like the one who is stumbling in the darkness and is never going to come out. Look at the difference between those two. The one who was given a light and is walking confidently among the people. They're holding a lamp in their hand. They can see their footsteps ahead of them. They know where it is that they want to go. They know what it is that they want to achieve and they're taking their steps from place to place. From, you know, avoiding the, the bumps in the road and the dips and the ditches and the rocks and they're confidently walking among the people. And the person who is stumbling about in the dark and they're never ever going to get out of it. This is a huge transformation. For a person to be stumbling in the dark, and maybe years they've been stumbling in the dark. They've never been able to find a path to anything. They've been falling over, they've been hurting themselves, they've not been able to find a way out. And then suddenly that person has a light and they can see everything in front of them. Look at the difference. Look at the transformation between this situation and between that situation. So this really requires, it requires tools. It requires tools in order to make this transformation. And I, and I want to start with a general set of principles or a general set of tools and then maybe go into some of the specifics, inshallah, towards the end of this particular uh, webinar. So first of all, to talk about a general toolkit for transforming yourself and for surviving and, and not just surviving, but thriving as a new Muslim. The first thing that I would give you is what Allah Azza wa Jal, mighty and majestic, He revealed in Surah Al-Asr, the chapter of Al-Asr, the chapter of time. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, Wal-Asr. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ By time, indeed mankind is in a state of loss, except those who believe and do good deeds and advise one another to the truth and advise one another to have patience. This really gives us four fundamental things that are the most essential four things for thriving in a state of transformation and, and change. The first one is knowledge. Because without knowledge, a person can't thrive. A person can't grow. There's no development. There's no... No one, there's no nurturing, nobody is, is becoming anything because there's no knowledge. At the end of the day, look at how Allah described the person who was given life after they died. A light that guides you among all the people. That light is knowledge. Without knowledge, we can't succeed as Muslims. And knowledge is mentioned in this surah by necessity because all of the things that are mentioned all of them require knowledge. You can't achieve any of them without knowledge. You can't achieve proper faith without knowledge. You can't achieve even the concept of worshipping Allah alone. You can't do without knowledge. You can't 
do righteous deeds without knowledge, knowing what's good, what's bad, what to do, what not to do. You can't advise people to the truth if you don't know what is the difference between the truth and the falsehood. You can't be patient without the knowledge of how to do so and the knowledge which carries you through those difficulties. And it, there's an amazing example in the statement of Yaqub, Jacob the Prophet, alayhi salam, when he lost his son Yusuf and he lost his son Benjamin, alayhi salam. And he said, as Allah Azza wa Jal transmitted to us in the Quran, he said, Innama ashku bassi wa huzni ila Allah wa a'lamu min Allah ma la ta'lamun He said, I only complain of my grief and my sorrow to Allah and I know from Allah that which you do not know. Look at how he mentioned how he coped with these huge calamities. He lost his two most beloved sons, one of them seemingly forever, one of them enslaved or imprisoned in the court of the king. His eldest son has put himself into exile in Egypt. He's lost so much. He's gone blind from his sort of extreme sorrow over, his, over what's happened to his family. He knows that somehow his other children are involved. He says, I only complain of my grief and sorrow to Allah, and I know from Allah what you don't know. That's why he was able to pass that test because of knowledge. That's why he was able to handle those changing circumstances and those difficult circumstances because of knowledge. And this is one of the things that I strongly advise to every single new Muslim, continuous learning. Knowledge, continuous learning. And continuous learning is so important because sometimes we get a motivation for knowledge. We start becoming motivated. We, get, we, you know, we feel like we really want to, uh, you know, to go out and learn something. But then a week later, a month later, six weeks later, and that desire for knowledge has, you know, the flame has kind of died down and we become, you know, reached to a level where we just, not, we just don't have that continuity and regularity. And that's why our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, she said, سُئِلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَيُّ الْأَعْمَالِ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ The Messenger or the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, he was asked, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, which deeds are the most beloved to Allah? قَالَ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ قَلْ He said, the most regular and consistent of them, even if they are few. And it's mentioned about our mother Aisha, that is the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha, that when she would start something, لَزِمَتْهُ She would stick to it. So it's very, very important to be continuously seeking knowledge, even if it's only a small amount every day. Okay, first one is knowledge, and I mentioned on a side point, continuous, regular knowledge, no problem. Now I'm gonna to come to the second point, and that is acting upon that knowledge, putting it into practice. إِلَّا amanu wa amilu salihat except those who believe and they do righteous deeds. So many of us, the problem we have is we have knowledge of Islam. We do know some things. We know that Muslims have to pray five times a day, no matter what the circumstances are. We know, for example, that a Muslim lady has to wear a hijab and she has to cover herself according to the rules that are legislated in Islam. We know that interest is a riba or usury and interest is forbidden. We know that it's not allowed to drink alcohol. We know many, many things about Islam. But we don't always implement everything that we know. So there is a disparity or a gap between what we know and what we put into practice. And that's the thing that we have to work on trying to remove. 
We have to make it so that every time we hear a hadith or an ayah, a narration from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or a passage from the Qur'an, we implement it, we get it, we put it into practice, even if it is in the most simple way that we can, but we put it into the practice. Even if it's only one time, we try to put it into practice so that we are not from those people who have no knowledge or from those people who have knowledge but don't practice it. And if you want just to link that into another surah, then I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have heard Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Qur'an. Most of you will have learnt it by now from among the new Muslims. We might have some new Muslims who just became Muslim very, very recently and they're still learning it. Surah Al-Fatiha at the very end, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, Allah mighty and majestic, He said, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Guide us to the straight path. The path of those that you bestowed your favour upon. Those you bestowed your favour upon. Who has Allah bestowed his favour upon? وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, those will be along with those who Allah bestowed His favor upon from the Prophets, the people who were people of truth, the martyrs and the righteous. But then Allah talked in Surah Al-Fatiha about another group or two groups of people. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Not those who have earned your anger or those who have gone astray. Who are those who earned the anger of Allah? They are the people who had knowledge, but they didn't implement the knowledge they had. They didn't put it into practice. Who are the people who went astray or were misguided or were ignorant? They are those people who didn't have knowledge in the first place. So we have to join between knowledge and putting it into practice. The third thing from the four that we need, the four tools that we need, the first one was knowledge. The second one is put what you know into practice. The third one that we need is we need to convey what we know to other people and we need to advise one another. So conveying to people, spreading the message to people. When you've learned something and you have put it into practice, try to share that message with people. Try to help other new Muslims around you. And that doesn't mean speaking without knowledge because not always helping someone means you have to answer the question. Sometimes it just means you have to put them in touch with someone that can answer the question. But supporting people around you, helping others, not just being a person who looks at yourself in terms of knowledge and in terms of actions, but a person who also looks to share and benefit other people again with knowledge because speaking about Allah without knowledge is a very serious thing speaking about the religion of Islam without knowledge is a very serious thing indeed and that you say about Allah that which you don't know it's a very 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 serious thing so we don't want to encourage people to say things they don't know but we want to encourage either put the person in touch with someone who can help them Either, you know, when you're sure of something and you know it, support the person, help other people, share that message with a wider group of people than just benefiting only yourself. And the fourth, when you do those things, you're going to encounter bumps in the road. You're going to encounter difficulties. You're going to have some problems. Sometimes things are not going to go the way that you wanted to. In this time, you need to be patient. They are people of patience. You need to be a person of patience. And ultimately, patience is really of three types. There are really three types of patience. Number one, patience 
in a being Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal, He told us, رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فَاعْبُدْهُ وَاسْتَبِرْ لِعِبَادَتِهِ هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ سَمِيًّا Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them. So worship Him and be patient, be consistent, be persistent, be regular, be patient in worshipping Him. Because worshipping Allah requires patience. And part of that is your five daily prayers. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, he said, Al-Ahdu Alladhi Baynana Wa Baynahumu Salah Faman Tarakaha Faqad Kafar The difference between us and them is the prayer and whoever leaves it has disbelieved. Very important that we hold on to that prayer, but that prayer requires consistency, it requires patience to pray five times a day, every single day. So we have to train ourselves to have that patience. The second type of patience is patience in avoiding the haram. Because ultimately sins and what's forbidden to us as Muslims, there's nothing in Islam that is forbidden except because it's bad for you. Allah never forbade something for you for the sake of it. He forbade it because it's not good for you, it's harmful for you, whether you recognize that harm, whether you don't recognize that harm. So if something is harmful to you and it's causing you harm and you recognize that Allah knows what's best for you, there's going to be temptations. There's going to be times where you are exposed to shahawat, desires. You just want to do something. You find it hard to control yourself. But you have to remember the statement of Allah, mighty and majestic, when he said, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى And as for the one who fears standing before his Lord and he forbids his soul from what it desires, he stops his soul from doing those wrong things that it wants to do and it craves and then the shaitan, the devil's adding to it and inviting you to it but he stops his soul she stops her soul from doing what is going to cause from its desires from its cravings that are bad then paradise will be that person's destination the third type of patience is patience in the face of the difficulties and calamities you face when you're doing all of those things you're being patient in doing good deeds. You are being patient in keeping away from the desires of your soul. You are getting knowledge consistently and regularly. You're putting that knowledge into practice as much as you can. You are trying to help other people along the way and share beneficial advice and words of encouragement. And when you're doing all of that, difficulties come along the way. And that's where you need to have patience in the face of those difficulties. One of the fundamental parts of a Muslim's belief is that everything happens by the decree of Allah. Everything happens by the decree of Allah. Whether you think that it's good or bad, whether it's something, whatever it is, everything happens by the decree of Allah. And that is part of the test that we face. That's part of the test that we face. So you have to overcome that through something which, again, was described by Yaqub, by Jacob, alayhi salam. Beautiful patience. The most beautiful kind of patience. And that patience comes from a confidence that you know that Allah has a plan. And you know that Allah is so merciful. And you know that Allah is so kind. Allah will not give you any decree except that there's an opportunity in it for you. Allah will not give you a hardship except that there's a chance in it for you to achieve something amazing. Everything, no matter how bad it is, no matter how much evil or trouble or problems happen to you, there is something in there that is good for you. There's an opportunity in there for you. Even in the punishment of Allah, 
that happens in this world, there is a chance to come back to Allah, a chance to repent. There's an opportunity for good. We give them some of the minor punishments in this world rather than the greater punishments so they might come back to Allah, so they might return to Allah. Repent to Allah. So even in the worst case scenario that Allah is actually punishing a person in this world, there are still opportunities for that person to actually turn that into a positive, for Allah to replace their bad with good, and for them to actually come out of that in a far better situation than what they went into it with. Now that is the general framework. Knowledge, action, spreading the message and indeed supporting one another and patience. Patience in doing good deeds, especially the prayer. Patience in keeping away from sins and desires that are forbidden. And patience in the face of the difficulties and calamities that in reality are opportunities for you in the sight of Allah, mighty and majestic. There are a couple of other points that I would like to mention that will help you to manage this transformation. And there are two particularly, or three, that I would like to share with you. The first one I would like to share with you is Uluwul Himma, having high aspirations and big goals and a drive that pushes you forward. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةِ فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ If you ask Allah for paradise, ask Him for the highest place in paradise. You have to have a drive that pushes you through this transformation. That no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, you have an image. It's like, you know, you see these people who they do these really amazing uh, physical transformations. You know, they, uh, for example, they lose a lot of weight and they, you know, they go to the gym and they, you know, sort of change their whole way that they look. And subhanAllah, you see these people and you say, what was it that drove you to leave your food, to have this, you know, these very small meals, to go to the gym for this many hours a day, for this many months, and you are striving and struggling until you got your result. They said, I had this image, I had this drive, because in my mind I had this image of the body that I wanted, the physique that I wanted, and I was just, you know, I was just working towards it day and night. I just had that goal and that drive. Would you not have a drive and a goal for something that's way more important than how you look or, you know, how much you weigh or whatever? Islam, paradise, where's the drive? Where are the aspirations? Where are the lofty goals? So that's very, very important. That's one thing I would like to share with you. I already shared with you the importance of permanent change and continuity, you know, being regular. I think the next thing I would like to share with you just as we come towards the conclusion of this um, short webinar, inshallah, is I would like to share with you the importance of having good friends around you. And to be honest, you know, in this early stage, when you are in a stage of being really, you know, very new to Islam and in need of support from Allah and then from those whom Allah makes a means for you to be helped and supported and aided from among your brothers and sisters in Islam. At the end of the day, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, المرؤ على دين خليله فلينظر أحدكم من يخالل A person is on the religion of their close friend. So let every one of you look, let every one of you look at who they took as a close friend. Let every one of you look at who they took as a close friend. There is an ayah in Surah Al-Furqan, which Allah Azza describes this in an amazing way. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, وَيَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا 
يا وين تاليتني لم أتخذ فلانا خليلا لقد أضلني عن الذكر بعد إذ جاءني وكان الشيطان للإنسان خذولا On the day when the oppressor will bite on his two hands out of despair, out of frustration and will say how I wish that I took away with the messenger. Woe to me how I wish I didn't take this person as a friend. They misguided me after the remembrance came to me and shaitan is always betraying and harming mankind. So here we are told about the betrayal of the shaitan. We are told about the situation that a a person will be in because they took the wrong person as a friend. They took the wrong person as a friend. And the shaitan left them behind and abandoned them after he convinced them to go with the wrong group of people. The right group of people can make such a difference to you. The wrong group of people can bring so much harm to you. So having the right people around you is so, so important. Alhamdulillah, you know, the fact that you're watching this from Islamic Information Center means you have contact with Islamic Information Center, inshallah. You have contact with people who can put you in touch with the right people to be around you. Because like the Prophet ﷺ gave the example of the, the, the good friend and the bad friend, the Jalisul Salih, the righteous companion, and the Jalisul Su, the evil companion. The example of the righteous companion is like Hamil, and misk, like the one who carries perfume, sells perfume. Either that person is going to give you per- perfume, or you're going to buy it from them, or at least you're going to have a nice smell wherever you go with them. And the example of the bad friend is like the example of the one who blows into the blacksmith's furnace. Either they're going to burn your, th- your clothes, or either the smoke and the smell of the furnace is going to come upon you. That's the example that the Prophet ﷺ gave of a good friend and a bad friend. So you really have to think about surrounding yourself with the right people. Last tip that I'm going to give you for surviving this transformation, and this is perhaps the most important in a way of all of them, even though it's within what I've said already, but just to highlight it, is the importance of sticking to Islam, the pure Islam, the Islam that Allah revealed to his messenger, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And not a person being fooled by different ideologies and beliefs, going astray through doubts and confusion, getting themselves mixed up about the difference between Islam and culture, Uh, or thinking things are from Islam that are not from Islam, ultimately all salvation, all success comes from the book of Allah, which is the Qur'an, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, what he said and did and approved of and his description, and the way that they were understood by the companions, um, those companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and may Allah be pleased with them, the way that they understood the religion, the way that they practiced the religion. And ultimately, when I first became uh, a Muslim, when I was a new Muslim, well, this really, really caused me a lot of difficulty. Many different groups, ideologies, beliefs, people pulling you this way and that way, everybody telling you to do something differently. You know, even in wudu, sometimes three people telling you to do wudu, maybe more than three different ways. And you're just confused what to do. Ultimately, You've got to go back to the Qur'an, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his narrations and how they were understood by the companions. And that's what the Qur'an commands us to do. That's what Allah commands us to do in the Qur'an. As Allah said, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدِ اِهْتَدَوْا وَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّمَا هُمْ فِي شِقَاقٍ 
Allah said, if they believe as you believe, as you companions believe, then they are rightly guided. And if they turn away, they're only in disarray. No doubt for a new Muslim, it's difficult to access the Qur'an in Arabic, even with the translation, which is not perfect. It's difficult to access the narrations of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You do have to have a teacher, but it's so important that you find yourself that reliable teacher. I would definitely recommend Islamic Information Center and that you stay in touch with them. You have yourself a reliable teacher. Whenever you hear something from someone that doesn't match what your teacher has told you, doesn't mean that your next teacher is right and they're wrong. Everyone can be wrong. Everyone can be right. But you need to go back and find out and understand it. Go back to your teacher. Ask for explanation. Don't presume things. Don't dive into things so that you stick onto the Islam that is the Islam that the Prophet, peace be upon him, came with. That's the light that Allah gave to the person who was dead and Allah brought them to life and gave them a light. That light is the light of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the way the companions understood it. And it's not the confusion and the mixed up religion and the things that many, many Muslims today are sadly confused about. So that's really, really important. And I would give you, you know, my advice would be to stick to it. And that advice is taken from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very famous narration in which he said, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِ عَضُّوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم He said whoever of you lives for a long time are going to see a lot of people differing and disagreeing about things. So stick to my sunnah. The sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs who will come after me, the companions, the four caliphs from among the companions, the rightly guided caliphs who will come after me, hold on to it and bite onto it with your molar teeth and keep away from all of the newly introduced practices in Islam, these things that people bring into the religion that were not from the Prophet, peace be upon him, that we call innovations, keep away from all of those. So that's the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I believe it's so important for the new Muslim. So that concludes my brief webinar. We've been discussing how to cope and deal with this huge transformation, the transformation from death to life, the transformation from, transformation from darkness into light. I hope I've been able to share some benefits with you and we ask Allah for his success and we ask Allah to teach us what will benefit us and to benefit us with what he teaches us and to increase us in knowledge. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar and taken benefit from it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it. We ask Allah to bless all of you. We ask Allah for you and for us to make us firm upon the religion of Islam. We ask Allah for you and for us to make us from those people who die upon la ilaha illallah. And that brings me to the end of this webinar. And that's what Allah made easy for me to mention and Allah knows best. Wassalatu wassalam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We conclude by asking Allah to exalt the mention Grant peace to our Messenger Muhammad, to his family and his companions. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الله brought us into this world for two purposes two aims and objective is why Allah brought us into this world سبحانه وتعالى the first reason Allah brought us into this world is to attain beneficial knowledge al-ilm al-nafi'ah and the second reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he brought us into this world is to come with righteous actions these two qualities beneficial knowledge and righteous action are two things that we as Muslims should try our best to attain it every single day what is beneficial knowledge? 
What does knowledge actually mean? Knowledge is idraku shay ala ma huwa alayhi idrakan jazima. Knowledge is to know something as it is with certainty. And the greatest form of knowledge is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing your creator, familiarizing yourself with Allah azza wa jalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin wa min al-ardi mithlahunna yatanazzalu al-amru baynahunna li ta'alamu. Li ta'alamu anna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir wa anna Allah qad ahata bi kulli shay'in ilma. Allah mentions in this verse that he created the seven heavens and he created the seven earths. And Allah Taala He created every creation within those levels. And Allah tells us Subhanahu wa Taala in that verse why He created all of those creation. He says, "لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ." The reason why Allah created all of those creation is so that they have knowledge of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Knowing Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the purpose why Allah created the creation. And it's really clear in the verse. The second reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us is to come with righteous action. An amal salih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create the jinn and he did not create the ins except to worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The purpose why you're in this world is to worship Allah alone. You don't worship your desires. You don't worship the creation. You worship the creator who created the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brother in Islam and my sister in Islam, every single day that you wake up, you're working hard. You're trying your best to attain beneficial knowledge. And also, you are trying your hardest to come with righteous action. The first knowledge that you need to know is who Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to know your creator. If you don't know Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you don't understand your creator, then having knowledge of this world has no benefit for you. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said about the non-Muslims, he says, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ They know this world and the way that this world functions. They've studied it, but they are ignorant about the hereafter. No, in no way, shape or form am I saying that you shouldn't have knowledge of the dunya. Of course you do. You study, you learn. But what I'm saying is the knowledge of this dunya should not be on the expenses of your, the knowledge of the hereafter. And the first knowledge that you need to have is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, he praises the people of knowledge in the Qur'an. He tells us that he raised them subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah, he raised the station of the believers. The believers and the non-Muslims are not the same. The mu'min and the kafir are not the same. The mu'min is better. He believes in Allah. And the believers amongst themselves are not the same. The highest one amongst the believers is the people of knowledge. Allah mentions in that verse, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ The scholars have been given levels, stations. Also Allah Taala He mentioned that the believers, the one that has knowledge and the one that is ignorant are not the same. Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ Allah says, and this verse, the scholars they say, it is إِسْتِفْهَامٌ بِمَعْنَى بِمَعْنَى النَّفِي Allah is asking a question, but he's negating. And he's asking a question, but he's negating. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ It's a question here. But Allah is negating it. In English, this is called a rhetorical question. Yani the question, in it, the answer is in there. Allah is saying the people who have knowledge and the people who don't have knowledge are never equal. They are never the same. Why? 
Because the one who knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has knowledge of Allah, he has more fear, he's more conscious of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء The ones who have fear of Allah alone are the people of knowledge. The ones who truly fear Allah are the people of knowledge. The Quran that came down on our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 23 years the Quran was descending on the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. The first few verses that came down from the Quran is the statement of Allah Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq khalaq al-insana min alaq Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama bil qalam allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam Allah mentions in this verse, he says, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ Brothers and sisters, Allah mentions subhanahu wa ta'ala the word knowledge twice here. Allah also mentioned al-khalq, creation, twice. Also Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he mentioned subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, the term, ilm in the Qur'an more than 850 times. When we look at the word ilm, in all of its forms, Allah mentioned in the Quran more than 850 times. Why? The reason because knowledge is a high level in Islam. Allah does not like those who are ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most knowledgeable and knowledge is of great quality. Every Muslim should try their hardest to learn and to study. The Prophet wasallam, if you look at the Quran, he was never commanded to ask Allah to increase him in anything. But the only thing he was commanded to ask Allah to increase him in is knowledge. Say Muhammad, my Lord increase me in knowledge. Also the Prophet wasallam. He stated and he told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving you the ability to understand is a sign that he loves you. The hadith of Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan is sahih. مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ If Allah wants good for you, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا Anyone who Allah wants good for them, يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Allah gives you the ability. Allah gives you the understanding of this religion. So if you see yourself learning, acquiring knowledge, attaining knowledge of this religion, remember that you are a person who Allah wants good for. And if you see yourself not being able to study this religion and it's heavy and you're unable to learn, you have to understand maybe Allah doesn't want good for you. So it should scare you, my beloved brothers and sisters. It should make you want to work very hard and exert the effort and the hard work. As I said before, the first knowledge that you should start with learning is the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You learn His names, you learn His attributes and His characteristics that He mentioned in the Quran. You also learn the Quran. The Quran is the speech of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَهُ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَوْمٌ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ The Quran is the speech of Allah. And Allah tabarak wa ta'ala spoke it. So we attain the understanding of this book. The Quran is the last and final miracle. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he challenged the creation to come with the likes of the Qur'an. Qala ta'ala, Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِّمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبَدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Allah challenges them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, come with the likes of this Qur'an. But they never will be able to come with the likes of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an, it's a miracle. Allah sent it down from Himself. He passed it over to Jibreel. 
And Jibreel passed it to the Prophet sallallahu وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنْزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَى قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْذِرِينَ بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍّ مُّبِيلٍ In order to understand the Qur'an, you must study the Arabic language. The Qur'an is in the Arabic language. And the Arabic language is the language of every Muslim. It's not the language of the Arabs only. It's the language of every single Muslim. وَلِذَلِكَ A great scholar by the name of Muhammad uh, Ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah. He used to dislike anyone who knew the Arabic language to speak a language other than the Arabic language. So learn the Arabic language in order to understand the Quran, in order to understand the Sunnah. Also learn the knowledge of the Salah. After you study La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, you studied about the first part of the testimony, which is I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. You have knowledge of Allah. You go back to studying the Prophet والسلام, knowing his name, where he was born, where he died, his biography, salawatullahi wa salamun Then you move on to learning the prayer. The salah is wajib. It's something every Muslim must come with. Allah says in the Quran, فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّةِ Do not forsake the prayer. If you forsake the prayer, the hellfire will be your final abode. Allah says, فَإِذَا سَلَقَ الْأَشْرُ الْحُرُمُ فَقَتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُهُمْ وَخُذُوهُمْ وَحْصُرُوهُمْ وَقْعُدُوا لَهُمْ كُلَّ مَرْسَلِ فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَتَوْا الزَّكَاةَ فَقَلُوا سَبِيلَهُمْ Praying the Salah is a necessary thing. Learning about the Salah, the conditions and the prerequisites that you need to do for the prayer. What are the things that nullify your prayer? Once you attain that knowledge, my beloved brothers and sisters, you have come with the obligatory, required amount of knowledge. Knowledge is the key to success. It is the key to prosperity and nobility. Focus on learning your religion. There are many people who came into Islam and they became Muslims. And when they came, became Muslims, they learned the Qur'an, they learned the Sunnah of the Prophet and they changed the course of history. Great scholars of Islam were like that. If they didn't enter Islam, their parents entered Islam and they became scholars of Islam. Just because you're a new Muslim, it does not mean in any way, shape or form that you can't learn your religion. You can. You just have to come with the effort and the hard work. My advice to you is, knowledge will transform you. Knowledge will change you. Every single day that you wake up, your aim and your objective, as I said at the beginning of my lecture, make it beneficial knowledge and righteous action. That's it. It's that easy. Every day you learn something new about your religion. And every single day, you come with extra righteous action. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us from the people of knowledge who act upon what they know and what they understand. Subhanakallahumma bihamdih. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear respective brothers and sisters I greet you with the greeting of Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And before I start my lecture I would just like to extend my gratitude to those who invited me to deliver this program our brothers at the Islamic Information Center in Dubai, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you with immense greatness. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, La yashkurullaha man la yashkurun nas. Whoever is not thankful to the people, he won't be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also said, Man ata ilaykum ma'roofan fakafi'uh, fa'in lam tajidu fad'u lah. Whoever does you a favor, then try to reward him back. If you don't have anything to return the favor with, then the least you can do is make dua for that individual. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward our brothers who worked effortlessly to put this program together in order to benefit our newly practicing brothers and sisters. My lecture today, my brothers and my sisters, is specifically directed to two groups of people. The first group of people are the reverts, those who have embraced Al-Islam. The second group of people, my brothers and my sisters, are those who have jumped on deen. There is many things that these two groups of people have in common. And this is inshallah ta'ala what I want to speak about today. And the theme of my lecture revolves around how to keep ourselves firm in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or on the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to overcome some of the challenges that we might face. What I have chosen to mention to you guys today is a little book that I have put together which speaks about how to treat the heart and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for me to complete this book because my brothers and my sisters if we just take a moment now to think of what some of our problems are today and how did it actually reach the state that it is at today because if you think about it, my brothers and my sisters, one doesn't just wake up randomly and he starts behaving in a corrupt manner. It is only after something that has settled into his heart, which then leads him or causes him to act a certain way. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us in a hadith, ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب Indeed there is a piece of flesh in one's body If that becomes rectified everything else becomes rectified If that becomes corrupt everything else becomes corrupt And this is what my brothers and my sisters the heart Ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala He also mentioned something very very powerful He said فَقَلَّ مَنْ تَجِدُ فِي اَعْتِقَادِهِ فَسَادًا إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُظْهِرُ ذَلِكَ فِي عَمَلِهِ You're barely going to find an individual has corrupt tendencies in his heart or corrupt sentiments in his heart except that this is now going to become apparent on his limbs. So it's because my brothers and my sisters Corruption settling in a person's heart which then causes him to act a certain way. To carry himself in a certain manner. So what I'm going to speak about insha'Allah ta'ala is that which is going to soften the heart. Especially being in a society that has become so overly sexualized. It is so easy to fall into muharramat. 
into filth and evil, especially if one now has just embraced Islam or has jumped onto deen after being in that environment. It is so, so easy to be invited back. So there is a number of points that I would like to go through today, inshallah ta'ala, starting with, as number one, تَأْثِيرُ اللَّهِ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Above everything else. So in a nutshell, this point, my brothers and my sisters, is learning to say no. This is the advice that I can give to every single pra or newly practicing brother and sister. And every brother and sister that has embraced Al-Islam. You have to learn to say no. We have to learn to let go. And until my brothers and my sisters, we reach that point where we actually learn to think for ourselves. And we bite our tongues. And we fight our nafs. Even though it might be that we are going to be left without friends. But it is our hearts that is Ola, that is foremost, that we preserve, that we look after, which eventually is going to get us to the ultimate prize, and that is Jannah al Firdaus al A'la. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa labnun illa man ata Allah bi qalbin salim. The day when your children and also your wealth is not going to be of benefit for you. And look what Allah says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ But that which is really going to benefit one is him meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. And what that actually means, my brothers and my sisters, to purify the heart from shirk, from innovation, and from all types of sins. This sadness that we might feel in our hearts, this distress, this agony, this hardness, this emptiness that we are experiencing, my brothers and my sisters. What is it maybe down to? If you are feeling this way, my brothers and my sisters, then listen to what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala has to say. And this will further support the advice that I gave earlier of learning to say no, learning to let go. Look what he says. وَلَيْسَ لِلْقُلُوبِ سُرُورٌ وَلَا لَذَّةٌ تَامَّةٌ إِلَّا فِي مَحَبَّةِ اللَّهِ وَالتَّقَرُّبِ إِلَيْهِ بِمَا يُحِبُّهُ وَلَا تُمْكِنُ مَحَبَّتُهُ إِلَّا بِلِعْرَاضِ عَنْ كُلِّ مَحَبُوبٌ سِوَهُ He says that the heart will not experience happiness and it will not endure that ultimate sweetness except by loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that which he loves. And look what he says. وَلَا تُمْكِنُ مَحَبَّتُهُ إِلَّا بِلِعْرَاضِ عَنْ كُلِّ مَحَبُوبٍ سِوَهُ And you will not be able to truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except if you turn away from Allah subhanahu if you, only if you turn away from everything besides Allah azza wa jalla. And then he says وَهَذَا حَقِيقَةُ لَا إِلَهِ لَلَّهِ this is the reality of La ilaha illallah. Wahiya milla tu Ibrahim. Wahiya milla tu Ibrahim al Khalil. And this is the true religion of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Also, Ibn al Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala he says, Fal kalbu la yaflahu, wala yasluhu, wala yatana'amu, wala yabtahiju, wala yaltadhu. وَلَا يَطْمَئِنُّ وَلَا يَسْكُنُ إِلَّا بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ وَحُبِّهِ وَالْإِنَابَةِ إِلَيْهِ In summary, what he's saying is 
the heart will not be able to rejoice. It will not be able to be rectified. It will not be able to endure and experience that bliss. It won't be able to feel that contention, that coolness, that calmness, except by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shayateen are calling you to go back to your ways. That friend that even forgot you in jahiliyyah. When you start practicing, you find that the shaytan, he is doing everything in his power to cause you to return back to your ways. And this is when one learns to say no. And once, my brothers and my sisters, you put yourself in that habit of saying no and putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first before your loved ones, it's one of those things that is going to cause your iman to go sky high. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he also says, Man arada safa'a qalbihi falyu'thiri Allah ala shahwati. Whoever wants that pure heart, then let him put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before his desires. What we also need to realize, my brothers and my sisters, is that those that we choose to put before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only a matter of time before we are hurt by it. This is something that is very manifest, very clear in our lives. How often, my brothers and my sisters, and this is just ala sabil al-mithal, an example that I'm giving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling you to stay away from having haram relationships. A sister she puts the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on standby, or even a brother. He puts the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal on hold. He does whatever he needs to do in haram, and then he's left heartbroken. And this is what Ibn Taymiyyah Ta'ala told us hundreds of years ago when he said, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ كُلَّ مَنَّ حَبَّ شَيْئًا لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَلَا بُدَّ أَنْ يَضُرَّهُ مَحْبُوبُهُ Have knowledge that Everyone who loves besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something other than Allah azza wa jal, meaning that he puts these things in front of Allah azza wa jal, or before Allah azza wa jal. He said it's a must that he will be hurt by him. He will be hurt by it. Whether that is your job, that you've put your blood and uh, sweat and tears into Allah Azza wa Jal is calling you to carry out the prayer. But then there is that shaitan who's whispering. Making you feel uncomfortable with regards to your surroundings. Times like that when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, see how you feel after that. It's from the greatest of things that is going to keep an individual firm in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's going to keep him away from returning back to his old ways. Putting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. How often have we seen my brothers and my sisters individuals who in order to just please the boss or the people around him in his workplace and he didn't want to rock the boat, as they say, by asking for a prayer room or for asking for a facility where he can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was only a matter of time that he was hurt by these people that he tried to please. How often have we also seen individuals who because of them being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it meant 
that this would cause a bit of rift between himself and also the, his employers. Allah showered him with his blessings, with his mercy and with financial abundance. And some who left whatever they were doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The haram relationships, the haram workplaces, the haram that their bosses were imposing upon them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always gave them more. He always gave them more. And this is the promise of Allah Azza wa Jalla. The promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he doesn't fail in his promise. What was his promise? وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Azza wa Jal will always give him a way out. He learned to say no. He turned his back on the invitations of haram. Allah always gave him that which is better. One of my favorite the hadith, and this was the hadith that changed my life for the better. In many different ways and at many different times. And if we're just going to take something away from this lecture, I would request that we write this hadith down. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said, Innaka lan tada'a shay'an ittiqa'an illah illa ataka Allahu khayran min. You don't leave something for the sake of Allah. Being conscious of Allah Azza wa Jal, accept that He's always going to give you that which is better. I can sit here all the way till tomorrow and give you guys incidents after incidents of individuals who came to me personally telling me that they are involved in haram. Whether it was haram relationships or whether it was haram workplaces that they were working in. And what I mean by that, they were directly involved in either selling haram or engaging in haram when it came to the works that they had to carry out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always gave him that which is better. A neighbor that I have, my brothers and my sisters, subhanAllah, I remember, he was telling me about his accounting job, which involved riba-based transactions. And he would sit at home after he left his workplace, him knowing this hadith, and his in-laws would give him a hard time and look at him in a very, very low manner. What is this guy doing sitting at home? It's not a big deal what he's doing. And they would give him a hard time. And I would always say to him, Akhi, I have no doubt in my heart whatsoever that Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to immensely bless you with something that the mind can't imagine. And you're going to go through these trials in the beginning. But it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, Do the people think they're going to be left alone? They say, I believe, or we've believed, and they're not going to be trialed. That trial is going to hate you hard, especially at the beginning. It's going to leave you lonely. It's going to make you feel alienated, marginalized. But it's a test and it's only a matter of time. And this is my brothers and my sisters, the case of many of those who came up to me uh, talking to me about the haram that they were engaging in when they worked. So this brother, he left you know, my brothers and my sisters, most people that I know who are working in Saudi Arabia, who have been fortunate enough to live in that Muslim country and are working as English teachers, they are either in Riyadh, they're in Jeddah, and some, mashallah, tabarakallah, were fortunate enough to be in Al Medina. But most people are outside of the two harams, the haramain. I've personally never come across her. Having been in Saudi Arabia for the last five years, 
studying the of somebody who's teaching English in Mecca. This brother was the first. And for the maybe the first seven months he wasn't teaching anything. They were just settling in. And there you don't pay tax to the government. They were earning much more than that. They were earning as professionals over here in the UK. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them so much more. The ability to go to the haram just about every single day. And now the brother comes back a couple of years down the line and he buys one of the biggest houses on this street. And I said to him, I have no doubt in my heart whatsoever. The bigger the sacrifice, the more Allah Azza wa Jalla will give you. The bigger the sacrifice, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. And the more you let go of, the more Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to replace that with. Because you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Allah Azza wa Jalla is giving to the kuffar who disbelieve in him day and night. And you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just going to abandon you. A river sister told me the multi-millionaire life that she had before Al-Islam. She was actually in fact with a Muslim guy. This is before she became a Muslim. And he was filthily rich. She said she would go on sometimes shopping sprees where she would spend over 10,000 pounds each time. Just in a shopping spree, just like that. Every now and again. Money wasn't a big deal. Until one day, my brothers and my sisters, her grandmother passed away. She says to me that, and this is when, you know, really the penny dropped for her. She was standing on top of the grave holding a 3,000 pound Gucci bag and she asked herself the question, is that it? Is that what my life was, is all about? Imagine having all of that money. Imagine. And you're still not content. She would go to sleep crying every single night. Even though she had the house, she had the guy, she had the money. And she thought maybe I need to get plastic surgery in order to be more happy then. So I can feel better in the situation that I'm in now. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her with Al-Islam. And she left everything behind. There were people saying to her, just act like you're still with that guy. Keep taking his money. She learned to say no. She put everything to a stop. Let go. She's still being offered all of that money. But she said no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to replace me with much better and much greater. And now my brothers and my sisters, even though she doesn't live that life, she couldn't be happier. She could not be happier. Because she found that Islam and she learns to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always first in whatever situation she's in. So my brothers and my sisters, To recap, the first point is learning to say no. Learn to let go. And put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first before your desires. The second point that I want to mention, my brothers and my sisters, is غَضُّ basar. That which is going to safeguard our hearts and help 
us individuals who have just started practicing or just embraced the Islam is to lower the gaze. And a lot of the time when we speak about lowering the gaze, that which pops to mind is lowering the gaze from the opposite gender. Yes, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ Allah says also, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ Tell the believing men and the believing women to lower their gaze. And it's not, my brothers and my sisters, just from the opposite gender. That is enough to destroy our hearts. It really is. But also to lower your gaze from the things that you may have been attached to in your previous life. Going through your pictures of Jahiliyyah. This, my brothers and my sisters, is one of the biggest causes that one now begins to miss his previous life. And it's only a matter of time before he draws back into it. What the eyes can't see, the heart can't desire. This is what this point is speaking about in a nutshell. What the eyes can't see, the heart won't desire. And this is exactly what Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he mentions. He says, فَالْعَيْنُ مِرْآتُ الْقَلْبِ The eyes is the mirror of the heart. لِلْقَلْبِ مِرْآهِ مَا مِرْآتُ الْقَلْبِ الْعَيْنِ فَإِذَا غَضَّ بَصَرَهُ غَضَّ الْقَلْبُ شَهْوَتَهُ He says if the eyes lower its gaze, you find that the heart no longer has that desire. When the eyes lower its gaze, the heart won't have that desire anymore. Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ أَصْلَ الْعِشْقِ إِطْلَاقُ الْبَصَرِ He says that the foundation of becoming infatuated is glaring and gazing. That's how it starts. That's how it starts, my brothers and my sisters. It is the first spark to that fire. And especially, my brothers and my sisters, in today's day and age, when our society has been so sexualized, walking around today, especially if you are in a kafir country, or in a Muslim country that has become so westernized, it's so easy that this now becomes trapped in one's heart. And a bigger challenge that we are facing today is, my brothers and my sisters, is detaching ourselves from what we look at on our phones. So much so today that one can become so corrupted just by being in his room, before we used to tell our kids, our young siblings, don't hang around with so-and-so. Don't hang around with so-and-so, right? Sometimes we would beg our kids to come into the home and to leave off playing football or whatever. Khalas, it's become too much now. You've been hanging around with your friends. It's too late. You need to come home now. But now, the opposite has happened. We want to get our kids to leave the house. We have to drag them out of the house. This new monster that we're facing, my brothers and my sisters, is that a innocent young sister or brother are sitting in their homes. They're far away from the outside world, right? But they are outside and inside at the same time. How is that? He has the world at his fingertip. The world wide web is at his fingertip. So easily accessible. Fawahish, filth, evil, that which is abhorrent, despicable. Filthy is so easy to access. You have individuals who are trying to sexualize the hijab. You have individuals that are normalizing that which is abhorrent. And they begin to see this. 
constantly until it settles into the heart and then they start acting a certain way. We need to lower our gazes, my brothers and my sisters, from that which is around us. Especially that which we have left off in the past. It is the foundation of preserving your heart as Ibn al-Qayyim mentions. Allah he also says, Allah Azza wa Jalla also says, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا وَمَزَهَرَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا لِنَفْتِنَهُمْ فِيهِ Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, don't glare or don't stretch out your eyes to the enjoyment of this dunya. It will be a fitna for you. And point number three, my brothers and my sisters, is sitting with the righteous in beneficial gatherings. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Mujalasatu al-Saliheen tuhawiluka min sittatin ila sitta. Sitting with the righteous, it changes your state or it changes six to six. Number one, he says, مِنَ الشَّكِّ إِلَى الْيَقِينَ From having doubts to having what certainty. وَمِنَ الْرِيَاءِ إِلَى الْإِخْلَاصِ From showing off to sincerity. وَمِنَ الْغَفْلَةِ إِلَى الذِّكْرِ And also from being heedless to being someone who has remembrance of Allah. Number four, وَمِنَ الرَّغْبَةِ فِي الدُّنْيَا إِلَى الرَّغْبَةِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ From being somebody who covets after the dunya to somebody who chases after the hereafter. Number five, وَمِنَ الْكِبْرِ إِلَى التَّوَاضُعِ From arrogance to being humble. Number six, وَمِنْ سُوِ النِّيَةِ إِلَى النَّصِيحَةِ From having bad intentions to being somebody who Takes the advice or accepts the advice. Also, Imam Shafi Rahimullah Ta'ala he said, Man Habba Yaftaha Allah Kalbahu wa Yarzukahu al Ilma Fahalehi bil Khalwa. Whoever wants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up his heart. And he also would like to be blessed with ilm, then upon him is to spend time in seclusion. وَقِلَّةِ الْكَلَامِ And he's also somebody who doesn't speak a lot. وَتَرْكِ مُخَالَطَةِ السُّفَهَاءِ And to leave off sitting with the foolish. وَبَعْضِ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ الَّذِينَ لَيْسَ مَعْهُمْ إِنْصَافٌ وَلَا أَدَبْ And to leave off some of the people of knowledge, those who don't have fairness and etiquette. To conclude, my brothers and my sisters, I would like to mention something that Ahmed ibn Harb, who was from the righteous predecessors, he said, I worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 50 years. I never tasted the sweetness of worship until I left three things. We tend to ask this question all the time, right? Oh, I don't feel that sweetness in my salah, in my worship. I feel spiritually dead. My brothers and my sisters, this should be written in golden ink. He says, I left off pleasing the people until I was able to speak the truth. You are around your friends who are engaging in abhorrent, filthy speech, you tell them, Akhi ittaqillah, stay away from this. Instead of actually you just playing along, acting like there is nothing wrong. See how you feel after that. And behaving like this, my brothers and my sisters, will leave you without friends. But then my brothers and my sisters look at the second point where he says, وَتَرَكْتُ سُحْبَةَ الْفَاسِقِينَ حَتَّى وَجَدْتُ سُحْبَةَ الصَّالِحِينَ I left off these transgressing 
sinning individuals, friends that I had until I was able to have righteous friends. Allahu Akbar. And then he says, وَتَرَكْتُ حَلَاوَةَ الدُّنْيَا حَتَّى وَجَدْتُ حَلَاوَةَ الْآخِرَةِ I left off the sweetness of this dunya and then I tasted the sweetness of the hereafter. Each point, my brothers and masters, you can see it will lead on to the next. Speaking the truth around what? The people that are around you. Who are engaging in what? In evil. That leaves you without friends. Allah will bless you with righteous friends. Even when you then meet these righteous friends, you could still have that desire of this dunya. And when we talk about the desire of the dunya, my brothers and my sisters, what we also intend by it is becoming so occupied that we throw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala behind our backs. So when they accompany these righteous individuals, the love of the hereafter settled in their hearts. These are just some points, my brothers and my sisters, that will really have a big impact on an individual's life after he starts practicing. The first one was to put Allah Azza wa Jal first, learning to say no. Number two was what the eyes can't see, the heart can't desire, lowering your gaze from the things that we were maybe so attached to. Number three, the people that we hang around with. So easily we can get dragged back into what we were doing before. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from what we heard and to make us from those when they hear the reminder, they act upon it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, shadu an la ilaha ila anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My name is Abd Rahman Afia. It's my honor to be with you here today in this virtual new Muslim retreat. Uh, what a fantastic initiative! So big thanks to everybody involved in organizing it from the Islamic Information Center and anybody else involved. Um, I'm going to tell you something about myself, my journey, uh, my journey to Islam over the past. Well, uh, I embraced Islam at 18 years old. I'll get to that in, in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to share with you my story because perhaps in it there's some there's some lessons that might be some things that resonate with you. Uh, so let me just get straight to it because I'm not going to be speaking for that long. Uh, so I was born in London, in northwest London in 1974, down at uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. Uh, I was born into a very wealthy family, uh, grew up, uh, <laughs> grew up as a very wild child. Um, I didn't care about anything really except having fun. Um, we later found out that I had ADD, undiagnosed ADD, uh, which I still have today. One of the reasons I'm standing up and not making this video sitting down is that I like to, I don't like to be too restricted. So, uh, growing up in Northwest London, uh, six years old, seven years old, I started to become really disruptive at school. I started to get into fights with people. I'd make problems in the class. I found, I, I was very challenged academically. I, it's not that I wasn't intelligent, but I just, I couldn't focus on my work. We now know it's because of ADD and I didn't get the help 
back then there was no real help for things like that, I suppose. Um, so I was really disruptive at school and I got expelled from every single school I ever went to. I mean, that continued right up until my last school, which I think was 17 years old and I got kicked out of that one as well. I got kicked out of every single school I ever went to. I failed every single exam I ever took until I was 18 years old. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that. But the point being that growing up, I was incredibly disruptive, didn't care about you know being academically successful, didn't take anything seriously, partly because in my mind, I was always going to go and take over uh, my father's business. My father had a really successful uh, design, uh, interior design and carpet company. And the, 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 the plan was always for me just to take it over. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, doing well in exams or anything like that. I was just a rich kid and a wild child. Uh, I started smoking at nine years old. You could put some perspective on it. I mean, nine years old, I went to a school called Dartington Hall Boarding School. You can Google it. And at Dartington, there were no school rules. It was one of those very new progressive schools. Well, the school had actually been around for about 100 years. And then there'd been a change in the management. And they decided to bring this new philosophy of if you give children freedom, they'll grow up as responsible adults. Part of that freedom was there were no school rules other than the law of the land, uh, which meant that as long as I didn't buy the cigarettes, I was legally allowed to smoke them in class. And I did. I started smoking at nine years old. I started drinking at 12 years old. I go into my parents' cabinet. I take, take the, because they didn't drink, they were teetotalers, but they had drink there for their guests. So I would go in there, I'd put, take the whiskey out of, the, you know, put it into another bottle, top it up with water. They'd never know, but obviously they guessed it. I can't imagine what the guests were thinking when they were being served drinks. But anyhow, I was a wild child. So if I was smoking at nine years old and drinking at 12 years old, you can imagine, I guess, what else I was getting up to in, the, in, my, in my teen years. I grew up not believing in anything. I didn't believe that there was a creator. I didn't believe in religion. I thought that all religions were just man-made ways of controlling and enslaving the masses. So I was really anti-religion until I was at a party and I was 16 years old. And I'd been drinking, my friend had been drinking, his friend, his name was Simon. Uh, and Simon said to me, don't you ever think why we're alive? What's, why are we here? So I said to Simon, Simon, shut up. What are you talking about? We're here to have fun. We, what a crazy question. Like, we don't talk about these things. And he said to me, no, really, do you not think about it? And I said, Please stop. This is the most stupid thing I've ever heard you say. He said, no, really, like, are we just here to be like our parents, you know, do business, make money and then die and that's it? I said to him, just shut up, man, and carried on partying. The thing is, that question there stayed in my mind, not here, but at the back of my mind, and I couldn't get rid of it. So after that party, life went on as normal, and I remember at that time, Every now and then the question would come there, like, why are we here? Why are we here? And I'd, I'd forget about it. Like, it's not something I cared about. And I certainly wasn't interested really in finding the answer. But every now and then the question would come back. And I remember having to go to the library to, do, uh, to, to study for my exams. And this library was in St. John's Wood. So I went to the library. I remember sitting down there, maybe because of my ADD, I remember looking at, just looking around, being bored, and just looking for something to, well, I guess everything was distracting me. And I saw, I saw all the books. They were kind of almost in front of me, religious books. I was like, ah, oh, what's this nonsense? Let me have a look at this. Because I didn't, I thought, I already went in there with a closed mind saying this is all nonsense. Anyway, because I, I guess I was distracted, I said, let me have a look. So I took the book down. I think the first book I took down was the Bible. And I started reading the Bible, you know, flipping through it. I didn't really find anything in there that, that, that connected with me, but it was kind of a welcome distraction. Anything but, you know, doing my homework. So I sat down with it for a bit. The next day when I went back, have another look at it, I didn't really find anything. And then over a course of a few months, I suppose I'd kind of done the same thing with all of the books on the shelf. So there was everything there, right? There was, there was Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, every type of ism you can imagine was there. The one thing that wasn't there was anything about Islam. Now I didn't think, where are the Islamic books? Because I didn't know anything about Islam. I didn't even know there was a religion called Islam. I knew that they were Arabs, and in my mind, they were crazy. Because why? I'd seen on television back then, you're talking about 28 years ago, no, sorry, 20, uh, 30 years ago, the picture of Islam or the picture of, well, <laughs> the picture of the Arabs at that time, which was portrayed as Islam, looking back now, see, was, was terrible. So all you ever saw on television 
were people hijacking planes. I remember images still burned in my, in my brain of you know people standing on top of blame, uh, planes with a machine gun in one hand and a copy of, and, and a mushaf in the other hand, Allahu Akbar, and me thinking, what are these people? They're nuts. That's what I was thinking. Um, anyhow, uh, after a few months of kind of looking at these books, I said, you know what? Forget about it. There is no answer to this question. Just put it out your mind. And, and, I, and I did. I said, there's no answer. Okay? But every now and then it would still come back. Then one day I was on a, I think it was about 17, about 17 and a half, going on 17 and a half. And I was, I think it was on a bus and I was going past a, a large mosque, a large masjid in London called Regents, in, in Regents Park called Central, Central Mosque. And a huge, huge mosque. I'd been past, <laughs> I must have gone past it a thousand times in my life and I never stopped to look at it. But this day was a Friday and I remember looking and seeing hundreds of people, it's a huge, huge mosque, seeing hundreds of people going into that mosque. And I saw people, I saw Pakistanis, I saw people that came from that part of the world, I saw people that were coming from the Arab part of the world, I, saw, I remember just seeing uh, people in their African dress. I, I saw people from like everywhere, and you don't see that usually in the UK. If you go into a church, if you go into anywhere, you'll see people, generally speaking, look the same and dress the same. I was like, who are these people? And I remember distinctively being at the traffic light, the petrol station was on my left and the masjid was on the right. And I remember thinking, who are these people? And the same way, the same way that I used to get distracted when I was meant to be doing my homework, I guess, I got distracted from going to, uh, going to college, going to school. Yeah, I think it was, it was, I was at Shuturo College at that time. They were the only people that would take me. And um, I remember saying, wait, I'm getting off the bus. Forget, forget going to college. And I got off the bus. And I remember, I was like, who are these people? I want to know. So I went, I crossed the road and I went over to the masjid, but I was too scared to go in. Plus it was, it was Friday, right? So the people, there, were, there were lots of people. It was like going, you know, if you've ever been to a football match, it's like when you get close to going, you know, through the tunnel and you're, you're about to go into the stadium, just the noise is kind of overpowering. It's just like a, a huge noise. And it was a huge noise from people talking. The chutbah hadn't even started. The Friday sermon hadn't begun. So I was too scared to go in there. Remember, I had a very bad picture of these, you know, whoever these people, because some of those people clearly looked like the people that I'd seen on television with their machine guns and their terrorism. So I, I, I wasn't going to talk to anybody. So I just sat outside. There was a wall and I just sat outside the mosque. And the chuppah started and I was thinking the, the, the Friday sermon started and it was in Arabic and he was shouting. I remember thinking, I don't know, what, what am I even doing here? I, <laughs> I should have just gone to college, like, but alhamdulillah, it was the last plan. But really, I don't know why I was just wasting time. Because I wasn't talking to anyone. So anyway, I sat there and uh, the people uh, <laughs> listened, to the, listened to the sermon. They came out of the masjid. They, they obviously left. And I was still sitting on the wall. And I was curious because I was just watching them. But, you know, obviously anything. I, I was, uh, having ADD, I was very easily distracted at that time. So just watching them leave I was mesmerized by them they all had like really nice clothes on but very different clothing and people seemed happy I saw people hugging each other like after the sermon I was like all right better get to college now I'm gonna face the music now I'm late for college you know be there about an hour and a half I think anyway just when I was getting ready to leave uh, a person came up to me from Sudan I, I now know you know he was from Sudan he came up to me and he said are you a Muslim I said no 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 I'm not a Muslim he said okay wait there I was like, okay. I was a little bit nervous, to be honest with you, but I waited. And he, he went away and came back with two books. I'll never forget them. One of them was a translation of the Quran, and the other one was a book. It was orange and blue. I can remember it like I have it in my hand now. And it was called What Everyone Should Know About Islam and the Muslims by a lady called Suzanne Hanif. I, I've never heard of her since that day, but I just remember distinctively that book. He said to me, take these books, read these books, and if there's anything that you have any questions about, come back to us and we'll help you. I said something, thank you, that's really nice. I, like, I, I remember being struck by how nice this person was being to me. Like he was, his, his manners were impeccable, the way he was talking to me was sweet. It was, everything about him was really nice. You know, here, here he was giving me these two gifts. I said, thank you. He said, keep this translation of the Quran, keep it clean. It has the Quran in Arabic and English, uh, the translation in English. So, you know, keep it clean and respect it and, you know, read it, you know. I said, okay, I will. Thank you so much. I went back home and I was quite, you know, thrilled by having these books. So, got home, started reading the book. 
When I opened the translation of the Quran, I found it very difficult to understand. It was written in very old uh, Shakespearean English, and, and and being somebody who just didn't go to school, just you know, even I mean, some of my exam results, I just got U, which means I didn't even attend. That's how give, I just hated studying. Um, I found it very difficult. I certainly didn't do English literature um, and hated Shakespeare. And this was written in that type of style. So I was like, oh. I tried to read it, put it away, took it down a couple of months later, tried to, uh, so forget it. So I was right back to there are no answers until one day, and I'm going to round off uh, uh, pretty soon now. One day I was on a bus and I heard two ladies talking about Hyde Park. Hyde Park's a beautiful park in the city of London, and they were talking about this place called Speaker's Corner, and they were saying, oh, it's crazy, you go there and you hear Buddhists talking, Jews talking, Christians talking, Muslims, everyone just talks and says whatever they want about their religion, it's crazy. And I heard them, and I, was, I thought, wow, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll get the answers that I'm looking for there. Because that question was still here, it hadn't completely gone. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was in nightclubs, I was partying, I was being a lunatic, but that question was still there, and I was... Just coming up to, I think I was around 18 at that point. I was almost 18, yeah, I was about 17 and three quarters. So I said, I'm gonna to go to Hyde Park. Let me go and see. So I went to Hyde Park one Sunday, I went to Speaker's Corner and I went in and the, the sound again, that same sound that I'd experienced at the mosque, just overwhelming sound of people talking and loud shouting. I went over and spoke, uh, uh, sorry, and I listened to everybody. So I listened to the Christian, I listened to the Jewish guy, I listened to the Hindu guy, I listened to the Buddhist guy. And quite honestly, I, everybody that I heard, nothing resonated with me. Everything was just, it, they didn't seem, they didn't seem in what they were saying any real connection with the real world that I was living in. It was all, it, it just went over my head until I came to the Muslim. There was a Muslim, he was originally from Trinidad and he was talking there and I, I remember, the reason I say it's from Trinidad, I remember his, I heard his accent, I was listening to him, I heard his accent, so that's a nice accent. And then I, then I saw that he, you know, he was talking about Islam. When I went over and I listened to him, straight away what he was saying hit me. What he was saying about the creation, about reflecting on creation, what he was saying about racism, what he was saying about human rights, what he was saying about science, what he, everything that he was saying, I was, I was looking at him saying, yeah, I, that makes sense. That makes sense. He was speaking in a really nice, very, very, really, just a, he had a really good way of speaking as well. And what he was saying made sense. He wasn't trying to, I think with the other, the other people, there was a lot of fire and brimstone, like, you know, war unto you. And it wasn't like that. He was just saying, this is Islam. And he was talking about Islam. It's the first time I really heard the mention of the word Quran since somebody had given me the translation outside the mosque that day. Everything he was saying connected with me, had an impact on me. And I stood there listening to him all day. He would get down off his ladder, I saw him go and pray, he'd come back. I was like, this, this, this guy's pretty, this guy, this is the first time actually that I'm really enjoying listening to this. And that's strange for me. Remember, I believe in God. I believe in religion. They're all man-made. So I was still very skeptical. Anyway, cut a long story short because I don't want to keep you. Um, all week I went away and I was thinking about what this guy had been saying. So I'm going to go back again. I listened to him again. Same thing. Hit me hard. I was like, he was talking about scientific miracles and he was talking about the purpose of creation and you know do you and explain that do you think you're just going to be created and messengers aren't going to be sent to show you how to live and everything he was saying was having an impact and so again i go back the next week and then the next week and, the, and then i started recording him out of waltman which is a very old shows how old i am right i'm 46 years old now so th this is back when i was 18 years old so i had, had a woman that i would record everything on and uh, i'd listen to him during the week about six months passed of listening to this person speaking every Sunday, reflecting on what he'd been saying during the week. But do you know, I had never spoken to him, not once. And I still knew virtually nothing really about the tenets of, of our faith or anything else. And I was still scared to speak to him. I didn't know what his reaction would be to me. I remember one Sunday, I started to get dizzy because I was annoying myself. I was like, come on, man, you gotta speak to him. Just speak to him, tell him, just tell him this. And I rehearsed my words. Tell him that you think you want to be a Muslim, but you need information, which was true. By that point, I was pretty convinced I wanted to be a Muslim, but I still needed information. I used to go and walk up and down Edgeware Road looking for information on Islam, and they had nothing back in those days. All the Arabic shops, uh, the only Arabic stuff they had on Edgeware, in Edgeware Road where I'd go looking was, was stuff on calligraphy and Islamic architecture, but there was nothing on 
Islam, nothing. So I remember I got kind of dizzy. I was like, right, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. I walked up to him after he, said, after he finished speaking. I said, listen, I said, hi. I said, you might not have time for somebody like me. He said, no, of course. Well, what is it? I said, look, I said, I think I want to be a Muslim, but I need information about Islam. He looked at me, he said, you want to be a Muslim? I said, well, in the future, but I, I don't have any, I mean, I've been listening to you, but I don't really have any, any information. He said, no problem. How about we sit down now? Would you like some information now? I can help you. I said, that'd be amazing. We sat down for about an hour and a half, two hours. He answered all of my questions. He, you know, it was a really nice talk. And I was like, this is great. This is exactly what I've been looking for. I'll come back next week and get more. He said to me, look, after two hours or so, do you believe what it is that, that, I, that we've been talking about? Do you believe that there's nothing that deserves to be worshipped except Allah? And do you believe that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last and final messenger? Do you believe what we've spoken about, the angels and about other and about all of these things? Do you believe these things? I said, yeah, I do. I've been listening to you for six months and what you just told me today, that just sealed everything for me. He said, okay, so if you believe it in your heart, why not say it on your tongue? Why not say it? I said, I don't, I've never had a problem saying what I feel. That's why I've always gotten so much trouble over the years. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind doing that. He said, okay, because if you do that, that's what a Muslim is. A Muslim is somebody who submits their will to the will of Allah and it starts with the declaration of faith. And I, all I knew is, all I remember thinking is, well, I do believe it in my heart. So yeah, I'll say it. What? Not really thinking about this is the day that I'm going to become a Muslim. All I knew is that I believed it in my heart and I'll say it. So he said, okay, repeat after me. And he, repeat, he, he, he said the Shahada in Arabic and I repeated after him stumbling along the way and he corrected me. And then, of course, he repeated it in, repeated it in English. And after I said it, I said, la ilaha illallah wa ahshara anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. He, 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 he gave me the biggest hug ever. He said, Allah Akbar, brother, today you're a Muslim. And I remember saying to him, no, 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 not today. Not today, not today. I, I don't want to do it today. I'll do it in the future, inshallah. Today, I remember saying, today I have to be a mini Muslim. And, in the and he was hungry. He said, no, brother, this is it. You're a Muslim. If you believe it in your heart and you say it with your tongue, you're a Muslim. All your sins are forgiven. And as he was hugging me, for the first time, I saw around me how many people had been standing watching. I didn't even know there were 40, 50 people watching us in the park because they knew what was happening. I had no idea. And then one by one, everyone came up and they were hugging me and they were saying, Allah Akbar, brother, you're a Muslim. I'll never forget one, one brother reached into my pocket. I had my cigarettes. He was like, you won't be needing these anymore. He tried to rip them. And I remember thinking, I said to him like, no, whoa, 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 whoa. I need those. I said, there are so many, I said to the brother, there are so many things that I'm still doing until today that I'm, I know a Muslim shouldn't be doing. I don't think I'm ready to be a Muslim. He said, you're ready because there's no day to be ready except the day when you believe it in your heart and you say it with your tongue. Shwaya, shwaya, he told me. Step by step, you'll get better. You'll start to work on yourself. The first thing is just to enter Islam. Then worry about everything else. They said to me, we're going to the mosque to pray Maghrib. It was the evening prayer. Do you want to come? I was just, I said, no, 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 it's been too much for one day. I'm cool, I'm staying here. I remember watching them all go off. I sat down in the park. I was overwhelmed. I knew that many challenges lay ahead for me. But wallahi, I remember saying to myself, Joel, that was my name before, Joel, this is the best thing you've ever done in your life. And I remember saying that. This is the best thing you've ever done in your life. In this video, I want to share with you some of the, some of the struggles that I went through and how I learned from those struggles, how I learned from those lessons. Because at the time when you're in the eye of the storm, the belly of the beast, so to speak, and you're going through a test and a trial and nobody's gone through it before you, you can sometimes only make real sense of it and learn from it after the experience. Which is why I think this event is so good because it allows you to be able to see what some of us have gone through and the lessons we learned from it, subhanAllah. You know, whereas back in my day, there was nobody written, there was nobody who had really gone through what, what I was going through. In my last video, I, I ended it when I became a Muslim. I took my Shahada in Hyde Park. And for about six months, I didn't tell my family that I'd become a Muslim. But then I started, you know, wanting to grow my beard after reading a hadith about that. And I knew I'd have to tell my parents. Cut a long story short, when I did tell them, 
uh, it didn't go down well at all. Despite the fact my parents were not religious, they also had no real belief. You know, we celebrated everything in our house, Christmas, Diwali, Hanukkah, everything, you name it. If it was celebration, we made sure we celebrated it. But for whatever reason, when I became a Muslim, it didn't, it didn't go down well at all. And despite my best efforts as a new Muslim to try and keep my family happy with me, they weren't happy with me. And they took me out for dinner one night and they said to me at the end of that dinner, they said, listen, you can be a Muslim but not in our house. Now you can pray, but not in our house. This test, this trial that I was finding myself in, I had been somewhat prepared for it. A beautiful brother in the mosque, Regents Park Mosque, that I mentioned in my first story, that brother there, Mahmoud Tayyib, had told me there might come a time when your own family might reject you because you embrace Islam. It might happen. And he told me about the Sahaba who had gone through those type of things, who had been rejected by their family for simply saying that there's nothing that deserves to be worshipped except Allah. I didn't know that it was going to happen that night. We finished a lovely meal at an Italian restaurant, St. John's Wood, and that's when they dropped that on me. They said, you've got a choice. The father told me, either, you know, come home and that's it, no praying. Because I was thinking, okay, I just keep being Muslim quiet. He said, no praying. If I find you praying in my house, you're out overnight. I told them, I told them, dad, mom, my sister, I said, I love you, but I have to love the one who created you even more than I love you. And the one who created you and created me told, her, told us that we have to pray five times a day. So if you want me to tell you now that I can't pray, that I, that's okay, I can't tell you that. Now, I don't want to be, I want to come home with you tonight, but I can't tell you that I won't pray. They said, that's it. My dad told me tonight, you're not my son. And they left me in the restaurant. They left me in the restaurant with no money, with no, no nothing. And that was one of the worst nights of my life because remember, I came, I came from a very wealthy, affluent family. You know, I didn't have to worry about anything growing up. And here I was for the first time with nothing. It was about nine o'clock in the evening and I had no, I, I couldn't go home because they told me I couldn't come back home. I was homeless like that. I remember I walked to Regent's Park Masjid. I said, I can't do anything, but I'll just wait for them to open it for Salat al-Fajr, the morning prayer, I'll pray the morning prayer, and I'll wait for Mahmoud, and I'll tell him what happened. Mahmoud came, I told him everything. He said, don't worry. He said, put your trust in Allah. Put your trust in Allah. And I remember thinking at that time, what does that mean? And I said to him, what do you mean, put my trust in Allah? What does that actually mean? Like I'm screwed right now. My situation's like, oh, this is bad news. I've got nothing. He said, put your trust in Allah. Make dua to Allah alone. And Allah is the one in whose hand is everything. Don't fear poverty. Don't worry. I remember I went to the, to the to inside the masala, inside the, the, the masjid. And I remember I made two rakat and I just sat there making dua. I remember crying. I said, oh, Allah, help me. Just That's all I kept saying, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. And I think the next day, because Mahmoud had arranged for me to sleep in the masjid that night, so I slept in the mosque. And then the next day, Mahmoud said, there's a new mosque that's open in Edgeway Road. They need somebody to open the doors at Fajr prayer, the morning prayer, and close the door at evening prayer, after the evening prayer. There's no salary, but there's a room, a bed, and food, and books, hadith, and everything in English. If you want it, you can go there today and start working there. I said, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, what could be better? What could be better? A new Muslim. My family's throwing me out. I'm homeless. And here I have a home, food, and knowledge about Islam in the books. I said, Alhamdulillah, yes, I'll take it. Well, I stayed there working there for six months. Six months. Can you imagine as a new Muslim how... How wonderful that was for me. How, how wonderful it was that I was able to be in seclusion for six months, just eating, sleeping, and studying. They had all the books there, Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, uh, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, everything was there. And that's all I was doing, building up my faith, building up my faith, alhamdulillah, and learning about my religion. You see, in life, we can't see what's around corners. So sometimes things look bleak, sometimes things look awful. But subhanAllah, around that corner is the ease. Around that corner, everything gets better. 
So I learned from that the importance of no matter how bad things look here, know that it's a promise from Allah that with every hardship comes ease and around this thing here, which we can't see past, but around it, alhamdulillah, there's ease, there's happiness. And after, after that six months, that's when Mahmoud contacted me, found out there was a young lady who also was a new Muslim, wanted to get married. Alhamdulillah, we met. I contacted my mom. I said, mom, please speak to dad for me. I'm going to be getting married and I want you to come to the wedding. She spoke to my dad and that was the beginning of things getting better between me and my father. And by the way, alhamdulillah, things between my dad and my mother and my sister, we're like that now. We speak every day, subhanAllah. So just because they kicked me out, it didn't stay like that. It was rough for, for, for some time, alhamdulillah. May Allah guide them all and open their, their, their hearts to Al-Islam. So that was one of the lessons, you know. Put your trust in Allah, cry to Allah, ask Allah, because Allah has got the power of all things, subhanAllah, you know, and will provide for you from where you didn't expect it. Let me give you another example of that. After a few years of being a new Muslim, of being married, of having a couple of children, I was still young, right? I got married, by the way, when I was 19 years old. London wasn't a particularly happy place for me to live in. I didn't like the weather that much, grey skies, raining, but also as a new Muslim, there was a lot of a lot of stuff against you know the new Muslims. So if you looked like me and you had a beard, and routinely people driving past, go back to where you came from, go back to your country. And I'm thinking, I'm more English than you. But it was bad, and there were, there were fights, there were problems on the streets, you know, walking about as a new Muslim in those days. There was no CCTV, so even though, you know, Islamic attacks or attacks on Muslims may now be higher than they were, we didn't have CCTV. A lot of stuff was going, was going on in those days that was never reported nor recorded. So I said to my wife, you know what? Why don't we just get a break? You know, why don't we just go and visit some of the Muslim lands? We decided we had a friend in Morocco. Let's go to Morocco. Let's just go to Morocco. You can stay there on a visa, a visitor's visa for three months. Let's just go, just have a break, alhamdulillah. So I was doing taxi work at that time to, you know, to make ends meet. And alhamdulillah, we went to, um, we went to Morocco and we loved what we found. It was beautiful. So we stayed for three months and we said, let's just get our visa stamped for another three months. And we did that. And I went back to the UK, did some taxi work to, you know, I was in touch with my family. We still weren't that close at that time. I do some taxi work, come back to Morocco. And, and then one day I said to myself, you know what, I would love to live in, a, in, in such a peaceful country like this for the rest of my life if I could. But there wasn't any work that I could actually get in Morocco. You know, there wasn't anything that I could really do. So I said, well, let me go to the internet cafe and just see what jobs are out there. So I went to the internet cafe. You had to, obviously, <laughs> there was no, hardly any internet in those days. So I went to the internet cafe and I remember searching for jobs and something came up and it said, conversation teacher, Saudi Arabia. I was looking at the job description. They wanted somebody to speak English to people in a language center, just speak English, not teach grammar. They were clear, we have grammar teachers and we have conversation teachers. We just want somebody to teach conversation. It's like, I can speak, I've always loved speaking. <laughs> My grammar's terrible, but I can, you know, and by that time, you know, alhamdulillah, I got myself some basic qualifications. Uh, you know, alhamdulillah, from when I, when, I, when I did become Muslim at 18, my mindset changed, and that's when I started getting academically sound, despite all my previous uh, failures, so to speak, for lack of better words. Anyway, I wrote an email to this doctor. He was called Dr. John. And I said, Dr. John, well, I remember the email like it was today. I said, Dr. John, let me start by telling you, I don't have any of the qualifications you're asking for, nor any of the experience that you need for this position. But let me, and I, I remember I said, and you probably turned off your computer and walked away, but just in case you're still looking at the computer screen, let me tell you something about myself on why I think I'd be good for your company. I started telling him everything. I'm a new Muslim. I can see things from both perspectives. I'm in love conversation. I, this long email. I went home. I said to my wife, I applied for a job. She said, you're crazy. I said, yeah, I know. And then I went back the next day to check to see the reply and nothing. So I went back the next day and nothing. I went back the next day and nothing until I'd gone back there for about 11 days in a row and then I said, forget it. And I did forget about it. Two months went by and I got an email and it said EO. I was like, EO, clicked on it. it said employment offer. Well, I had forgotten I'd even applied for the job by that point. I said, employment offer? And then it said, thank you for your application for a conversation teacher. We're delighted to offer you the opportunity. And I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it, subhanAllah. 
Do you know how much dua I'd be making that this job would come through? I didn't want to keep going back to England doing taxi work and I was, oh Allah, I was begging Allah. But then I, I just said, khalas, it wasn't to be. But it was, alhamdulillah. That was just over 20 years ago. 20 years ago, subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, I've been living in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia now for 20 years. Despite all of my academic failures in my early life, alhamdulillah, my life changed. I actually carved out a successful career working at the highest level, holding senior positions for 17 years in universities in Saudi Arabia as director and vice director of universities out here. Imagine, the person that got kicked out of every school, hates education, had a really successful career holding very senior positions, alhamdulillah. I realized after, when I was 17 that I actually wanted to, to transition more to the business world, so I decided then to go and get my MBA. I did it together with my son, alhamdulillah. When I came to Saudi Arabia, I was 26 years old. My oldest son, he's now 26 years old. We both graduated with the same MBA two years ago, a year ago, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, together at the University of Northampton back in the UK. So again, this shows you how things can change. And I want to leave with you one last story because this one is, uh, for me, will always be the most powerful one. When I, f I told you I came to Saudi Arabia, it was in 2000. Uh, alhamdulillah, I stayed for four years with a company. And then I wanted to leave that company to go to another organization. And I was the, I, everybody loved me in the first company, okay? Everybody loved me. The CEO loved me. And then I said to him, it's time for me to move on. I've got another opportunity. And overnight, they turned on me completely. I, I, they, they really were very unpleasant. And here in Saudi Arabia, if you want to go to a new employee, you need the permission of your first employee to transfer your work permit to the new sponsor. So I found a new sponsor, a new company. I wanted to go to them. They told me, no, they refused to let me transfer. I went through a real battle with them. I contacted very high level people, got people to intervene. No matter what I was doing, no matter what I was doing, they wouldn't agree. And this opportunity was a great opportunity with a great company. They wouldn't allow it. They just wouldn't give their permission for it. I couldn't believe it. I was saying, what is this? And I was getting really upset. Like my wife was then pregnant. I remember at the time, it was just, it was a, it was a, it was a nightmare. They were, they were telling me, no, if you want, Take a final exit, which means leave Saudi Arabia. You have to go back to the UK, come back in again with the new company. We're not going to let you transfer. And I was saying, why are, they, why are they not letting me transfer? During that time, I had no work, no money. So I had to work as a part-time teacher. When I was working as a part-time teacher during this terrible year, uh, I worked in a really small language school. There's a reason I'm telling you this. I worked in a really small language school. But I can tell you something. Wallahi, from my heart, I gave those students 100% because I believe that this job is a, is a trust from Allah and I have to fulfill that trust. So I would teach my heart out. I would give everything to the students. The word got around that they, that, that, that they really liked me from amongst all the teachers. And then the manager of the language school came to me and he said, listen, the, one of the silent partners in this business is a guy who works at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. He's, he's pretty big there. And he's heard your name a lot as being an amazing English teacher. And he wants to talk to you about an opportunity. So, okay, yeah, cool, all right. I had a meeting with him. He said to me, listen, we'd love to have you over at King Abdul Aziz University. We'd love you to come and join us there. I said, King Abdul Aziz University? Like that was a, if you don't know, that's a dream come true, especially in 2004, because that's a family package. It's a better salary. It's, it's stability. It's an amazing opportunity. I said to him, but I don't know the qualification. I showed my qualifications. This is what I've got. It's just the basic stuff at that time. Just the basic stuff. He said, that's fine. You fulfill all the requirements. What are you talking about? You, do, you will have to leave the country still, okay? Because they're not going to give you a transfer. But we'll pay for your tickets to come back in and you start your new life with us at King Abdul Aziz University. It was an amazing opportunity. Now, I'm getting to the big part. I couldn't believe that it was only because I'd gone through that trial of the company saying, we're not going to let you transfer. Because I went through that trial and I had no money that I, and I had to get a job as a teacher in a small language center. But because of that, and because of working hard, it had led to a meeting with somebody at King Abdul Aziz University who was now offering me directly a package there. That all came. Had I got what I wanted from the first company and they just said, yeah, sure, transfer. 
then I would have completed the process within two months. I would never have gone to work at that small language school. I would never have got the opportunity to work at King Abdulaziz University because I'd never have met that. But I wouldn't have been working in a you know, crummy little language school, would I? If I got what I wanted. But sometimes you want something, it's not good for you. Sometimes you hate something, but it's good for you. So there I was saying, why are they doing this to me? They loved me before and now they treat me like this. Why are they doing it? Alhamdulillah, Allah is the best of planners. But that wasn't the best part. The best part, and I'll end on this, the best part was, or the biggest ni'mah, the biggest blessing was, when we went out and we came back in with King Abdulaziz University, about four months into the job, we discovered that my daughter had a defect in her heart and she would require open heart surgery and she was less than two years old, which is extremely risky. The surgery that she needed and the subsequent work that she would need, the follow-up work, wouldn't be covered, we found out, by any insurance company. If you have to get this done for your daughter, you will have to leave the country. There is no insurance company that will cover that. Why? Because it's a congenital defect or congenital abnormality, should we say, for lack of better words. No insurance will cover it. No insurance will cover it. So that means if that happens to you, you will have to leave the country unless you work for a government university or a government entity. I was working for King Abdulaziz University, which meant all of the medical care came under King Abdulaziz University Hospital, meaning all the open heart surgery and everything that was needed was all financially taken care of. Look, if I'd got what I wanted and got any of the jobs, because I came up with about six or seven different people that I wanted them to let me transfer to, if I'd got what I wanted and then we discovered my daughter's uh, condition, we would have had to leave the country anyway and be, we'd be back in the UK going to the NHS trying to get you know, her, her, her problems uh, sorted. But Allah's the best of planners. And because we were patient, alhamdulillah, and we found and we, 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 we realized the huge blessing of Allah. And the, again, what's around corners, we can't see it. You think that something's bad for you. You think this is, why is it happening? Be patient because around that corner is ease. Around that corner is blessings. If I got what I wanted, subhanAllah, we would have still ended up back in the UK. But Allah was the best of planners and will that through them not letting us transfer, I would have no money, go through hardship. Because of the hardship, I'd work in a crummy language school that I'd probably never want to work in anyway. But because of that, I met somebody who then offered me a job at King Abdulaziz University. Not only was that package, that opportunity, better than the first one that I wanted them to let me transfer to, but more importantly, my daughter's medical care, which came to more than half a million reals. All of that medical care for the years that she needed it was all covered and it would never have been covered had I not been working at the King Abdulaziz University Hospital. These are some of the trials that I've been through. These are some of the lessons that I've learned. And the main one is to never give up. Put your trust in Allah and remember that no matter how bad it seems, after every hardship comes ease. With every hardship comes ease, around that corner that we can't see is something that's good for us. So crying about it, moaning about it, doesn't do anything. But raising your hands, getting up in the last part of the night, asking, oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, help me. Making these du'as, these supplications, that is where the power is at. Limited time. I hope I didn't speak for too long. I hope that some of what I said brings value. Anything that you found, anything that was good, it's from Allah. Any mistakes, it's from myself, from Shaitan. جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته